Hey students, welcome to unit number seven, where we're going to be discussing literature searching. Now, I'll prepare you for that this is going to be a relatively long lecture because we are covering unit seven and unit eight. So, our objectives for today for unit seven are one, understand the purposes of literature searches. And then two, we're just going to run through a quick example of how to perform a literature search, maybe some problems you might run into and some ways that we can get our, uh, through with that. So what is literature search? Well, a literature search is, a per is performed when we're trying to get all the information on a certain scientific topic. In the case of this class, your certain scientific topic is the topic that you are assigned to. So that's either cognitive dissonance theory, social identity theory, social comparison theory, and etc. So, for example, if we're interested in getting information on social dissonance theory, so we do literature search to find out more information on it. In order to do this, we want to find those primary sources that we talked about before, right, which are like scientific journals or chapters in books. And the way we do that is we go through certain online databases to find information on these topics. Some of those databases that we're looking for are PsycInfo, PubMed, one of my personal favorites is Google Scholar and the CSU Library Database. We're actually going to be doing, we're going to be going through an example of PsycInfo through the CSU Library Database today. So as I've discussed before, there's a difference between primary and secondary sources, right? Primary sources are when we're getting it directly from the source. These are your scientific journals. These are your review articles. These are areas where someone directly observed and, and did a study or is writing about one content area in which they're deeply knowledgeable in, or a group of people. It doesn't have to be one person. In fact, most of the time, it's a group of people writing about this, two or more people writing about it. Additionally, there are secondary sources in which a source is paraphrasing a different source. These are things like Wikipedia, your news articles, uh, maybe some sort of book or, or, or something like that. But keep in mind, we're, for the purposes of your paper, you won't be really looking for secondary sources. Instead, you'll be sending your concentrations on primary sources and where you're getting actual scientific journals. And today in this lecture, I'm going to be teaching you how to actually go about that so that we get real primary sources, real scientific journals that use this empirical science to get their information. So some types of articles that are really considered primary articles are A, research reports. These are original studies that take uh, some sort of information and actually do a study on that um, and using empirical evidence. Review articles in which it's evaluation of the field on a single subject. So what this is, it might seem like a secondary source, but the thing is, it's a very, very in-depth um, review of the literature um, of a certain content era, era, area. Additionally, we have theoretical articles um, in which there's a development of theories. And I would actually kind of advise you, if you can, find the original article associated with your theory. Uh, for example, one of yours, I'm not going to say who is, but one of yours is conducted by uh, Albert Bandura. Um, so go ahead and just one, of, one of your content areas, some group in here did have a um, development of a theory by Albert Bandura. Additionally, there's meta-analyses as well. And later in this course, we're actually going to discuss meta-analyses and how they're uh, performed. But essentially, just a little kind of quick overview, a meta-analysis combines data from many other relevant studies for joint analysis. And they get one, what's called the common effect size, in which case they want to try and figure out how well does something work in effect on some sort of outcome variable or dependent variable, depending if it's an actual scientific um, experimental study. So for literature searches, we're often, in, in, in the psychology field, we often use PsycInfo. That's one of the most popular uh, databases that we use. I personally use Google Scholar for a lot of things, but I'm gonna be teaching you through PsycInfo just because I think it's the most relevant to you and it has all the information that you need. Um, we can get direct to searches by getting a digital object identifier or an article title. Um, a digital object identifier is just some sort of like, uh, uh, it's called DOI for short. Um, it's just a series of numbers so that you can find a specific article or you can use the article title. I'm going to be honest, you'll probably be using the article title more than anything um, in order to find your information or using open-ended searches such as 
Uh, keywords is what you're probably going to be using the most often in order to find you. So you'll be typing in your theory, theory whether that be uh, social learning theory or cognitive dissonance theory. You'll be typing in keywords in order to get some journal articles associated with your theory. So today what we're going to do is we're going to walk through a psych info example. There's going to be a lot of little short slides that I'll be doing for you, but I think I, well, I hope at least that this gets through an example so that you can perform your own uh, psycho, um, psychological literature review to get primary sources on your subject content area, area, whether that be cognitive dissonance, social identity theory, social learning theory, or social comparison theory. So the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to go to the library website. And it's really important that when you go to the library website, you make sure that you're logged in with your student ID as well. On the bottom here, and if you go to the actual slides as well, you'll see that I provided you the actual uh, web link for the library website, which is lib.colostate.edu. And this is what it's going to look like. Um, for you to go ahead and start your literature review and literature search for your um, topic of interest. We're going to first click articles and databases in the A to Z database list, as you can see is highlighted in the red box here. You then are going to go, it'll take you to a new page and you're going to click on P because we're searching for a database called Psych Info. From here, you scroll down and try to find psych info, which I've highlighted in red for you. It's gonna take a little bit of searching and scrolling down. As you can see, it's near the bottom. Um, note that there's psych articles as well, and that's not the same as psych info. We are specifically looking for psych info because psych articles does not have um, as many primary sources as psych info does. Now, you'll be taken to this new page. It's called the Search Interface, and it's going to be hosted by EBSCOhost. Uh, so what you'll see is your main point of concentration is going to be in this highlighted red box here, um, in which you will be typing in certain keywords, and we'll be talking about whether you'll be using AND or 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 some sort of field that you'll be selecting. There's a lot of different um, areas of content that we can search for because I want you to keep in mind when you are searching through the search interface you can get anywhere from thousands and thousands and thousands of articles to about five articles or anywhere in between really um, the whole purpose of this is to filter it out so that we don't have these thousands and thousands of articles we want to be able to just have articles that are associated with our theory of interest for this example, what I'm going to be taking interest in is cyberbullying. Cyberbullying is a topic of interest for me. I'm very interested in adolescent populations, and cyberbullying is a very common occurrence in adolescent populations, and it's devastating towards some people in um, the adolescent population. So if I was interested in cyberbullying, I could simply type in cyberbullying into my search bar and click search, or I can even expand it more. As you can see in the red box here, I have just typed in cyberbullying. Now I want to note as well that there's ways that you can broaden or narrow your searches within um, this EBSCOhost psych info uh, search database. Um, you can enter in an asterisk at the end of cyber or cyber bully and it'll give you broaden your search. What it does when you do cyber it says I want you to find anything with cyber and anything that's connected to the word cyber as well. And you can experiment with these things and I'll go into more detail about some other ways you can broaden or narrow your searches with certain things. But for now, I'm just gonna type in cyber bullying and see what we get. Um, additionally, I wanted to indicate through this other aspect that this is a keyword. It's not an author, it's not a subject. By doing things like this, you're actually making it more clear for the search database of what you're searching for. So I'm doing cyberbullying and indicating that it is a key word. You can also find certain um, authors of, of interest. So for example, if you are interested in Albert Bandura, you can type in Albert Bandura and indicate that it's an author. But here we're gonna be mentioning it as a keyword. Then I simply typed in my cyberbullying 
indicated as a keyword and I'm ready to search to see what articles come up. And keep in mind, the majority of these should be primary sources. So it's done all the work for us. That's actually an advantage of doing this over just doing a standard Google search because a Google search will go through many, many uh, secondary sources for you. Whereas here, we're gonna be getting a lot of primary sources. As you can see, I've clicked search and, a, and a many different articles have shown up now. First one being a review of cyberbullying, which would probably be really interesting to me for me to get an actual review of cyberbullying. And then other things such as the measurement of cyberbullying, dimensional structure, and relative severity and discrimination. These are both actually primary sources. Um, as you can see, I kind of put a note here that it maxes out at five pages. If you want to go beyond um, results past 100 you can go to the fifth page and then click next however i don't find myself going past it too often unless i'm doing some really really intense literature review i don't see i feel like the articles you did if you did your search right should be within the first few pages for you um this is with the assumption that you did your search correctly and you're not in a totally other part of the realm of what you shouldn't be looking into So to me, I find that this five pages or, or, or thousands of different articles that we can look into to be potentially too much for me. So now I'm going to go ahead and narrow down my search. So I've already have cyberbullying in there and I've indicated that's a keyword. You'll notice that there's aspects where you can do and or you can change it to or and you can type in different keywords associated with your search item. I want to also show you that we can narrow it down by indicating whether or not we want a certain author. So say, for example, that I wanted a certain author with the last name L.I. as in Lee, and I wanted them to only cover the areas of cyberbullying. So cyberbullying and done by the author Lee, as you can see from the highlighted boxes, I could search for that content area as well. Another aspect I can look into is that I don't want it to contain certain languages. So if you go into that certain that bar where it said and before, you can change that to not. And I'm going to say I don't want cyberbullying um, articles that are in Japanese, which makes a lot of sense. I can't read Japanese, so why would I waste my time looking at the Japanese articles? I would only want articles that are in English. Um, uh, per se, um, unless you can read Spanish or German or some other language, then great, great for you. And you can read into those articles as well. I will say you're pretty lucky being an uh, uh, English speaking citizen here because most articles are written in English, even from other countries. So we're pretty, we're pretty lucky in that sense. Um, additionally, as you can see in the bottom left here in the um, highlighted with the red box, um, you can make it so that you can change the source type where you want it to be either just books or peer-reviewed journals. I would actually encourage you to click the peer-reviewed journals aspect because peer-reviewed journals are indications of uh, primary sources. So as you can see here, I click the peer-reviewed journals part and going to indicate that I only want peer-reviewed journals to be here. And that will guarantee that I'm only getting primary resources primary sources, I'm sorry. So I, I went ahead and changed the search a little bit and I said cyberbullying as a keyword and middle school as a keyword um, in order to talk about this. And notice how I only have one page of, of uh, results, which is really great actually. So I'm only interested in cyberbullying in middle school students. Um, and now I'm gonna in tell you how to actually get to the actual article. So we have two um, articles that we can see here. It's prevalence, awareness, and perception of cyberbullying among young adolescents within a middle school setting in Florida or cyberbullying among middle school students association with children's perceptions of parental control and relational aggression. Let's say I was more interested in the second article. If I wanted to get to that article, I could just go ahead and click that little magnifying glass to go ahead and show me more information about this um, article. So we'll see that when you click that magnifying glass, it tells you a lot more information we can see that this is a, we can see the title again. We can see who the author was. We say where journal it was published in. Additionally, what 
year it was published because we oftentimes want things that are a little bit newer unless it's like some sort of primary um, journal or primary article, seminal article that really revolutionized the way that we look at things. Um, and it'll additionally give me some subject matters. And really most importantly is it'll give me the abstract. And if you're not quite sure what an abstract is, an abstract is essentially a summary of the article that you're about to read. I would really highly advise you to read these abstracts before you even read the articles to make sure that this is an article of interest to you. So as you can see, as I'm reading through, it says the present study investigated characteristics of adolescence, cyberbullying, examined whether parental controls are associated with internet related behavior. Wow, okay, that sounds exactly what I'm looking for. So I'm actually very interested in this article. So when you go back to the search results, you'll notice that some of them have hits uh, that, and then they're ready to download immediately. These are great. You want these ones. These are the ones that you want to be able to download immediately um, from here. Um, so as we can see, this comparing children, adolescents engage in cyberbullying to match peers. Um, as you can see here, and I'll go ahead and use a pen to kind of circle it. Oh, hold on one second while I get this pen ready. There we go. Is it says PDF full text down here. I can go ahead and t and download the entire PDF full text um, from this article. No, and, and I guess I did it in the next slide, so I didn't have to highlight it for you. But as you can see, there's a PDF full text that I can download, which is great. Everything I wanted to, and you just click the link, and it'll download the article for you. And there's the article right here for you. And it's really great. It'll show you the abstract and you're able to read through the entire article so that you can do your literature search thing, um, review so that you can summarize the articles for me um, for your um, writing assignment project. Unfortunately, it's not that easy all the time though. Sometimes the PDF article link is not available with the PDF link. So what do we do? We use this thing called find at CSU, in which case we're kind of hedging our bets and hoping that Colorado State University has it somewhere available for us other than psych info or, or somewhere available for us. Um, and if they don't have it available, chances are they'll be able to get it for you and I'll teach you how to do that a little bit more too. But for now, we're gonna talk about how to find it at CSU. So the find at CSU, um, as you can see, sometimes you don't have the actual download article link. Instead, you have this little kind of green, yellow, and white box that are kind of the CSU colors where it says find it CSU. That's the link you're going to be clicking on to find things on CSU, uh, from the CSU library where they'll be able to track it down for you in an automatic fashion. And there you go, I'm just highlighting where it is, the find it at CSU, um, so that you can click on that link. When you click on that link, it takes you to a new page um, in which you can just, it'll usually fill out more of the information for you um, so that you can kind of try to find it um, in another, from another database system. Here it says that the full text is available via Informa World Taylor Francis and Journal so that we can click on that link to find it. So if I clicked on that full text via Taylor Francis online or whatever it was, it'll take me to a new link, in which case I can download the full text, which is great that CSU does all of this for us. Um, so keep that in mind. Don't be discouraged when you can't find it as a PDF immediately. Always go to that find at CSU. I find that about 90% of the time, it finds it for me somewhere. Um, there are about a good 10% of cases where you won't be able to find it, in which case um, we'll be discussing how you, even then you can still find the article. And then after that, it's about 99.9% .9 of the time you find the actual article. So what if the article still is not available? So it's not available by PDF. I went to the find it at CSU and it still wasn't available. What can we do? Well, luckily, Colorado State University has something called interlibrary loan. Um, as a note, this takes time. So it won't find your article immediately for you, but it will get it to you within hopefully a few days. Um, I find that it usually, they say that it'll take up to a week. I've gotten it within the same day before. 
Um, I mean, I'll be discussing you how to do this, but just to tell you that it sometimes doesn't take as much time as you would think. But there's a feature called interlibrary loan, which is essentially where Colorado State University Library, someone will actually go and actually find the article for you and be able to loan it out to you for a little bit of time so that you have enough time to read it for your project or class. So in the case where you couldn't find the PDF, you went to the find at CSU and it said that it's not available at all. Uh, we can use something called interlibrary loan. And what you'll do is after you do the find it at CSU libraries, you'll see this. You'll see that there's no available copy of it, and you it'll say we'll get it for you via interlibrary loan slash document delivery. Go ahead and click on the interlibrary loan and document delivery. Um, system in order to get this interlibrary loan process started. Um, if you want access to the interlibrary loan, you'll have to set up an account through the library. I went ahead and um, set up a link for you. You can find this from the PDF as well, or type in lib.colostate.edu slash I-L-L-I-A-D slash registration. Um, and you'll be able to create an account. However, I'll tell you just by going through the process, you'll be able to create an account through through that anyway. So just by trying to do it, they'll teach you how to create an account. Um, you'll be prompted to enter in your ID and password. So this is uh, whatever password you created. If you're a first time user, you go ahead and just uh, click on that first time user and then it'll teach you through the process but once you've created an account you log in with your username and password what happens is when you do this uh, it fills in a lot of the search fields for you automatically um, kind of what as you can um, so it starts with the title the volume the issue number what month or year it came out and everything which is super great you'll see that sometimes it doesn't fill it out as great as you want it to for example you can see that the title kind of gave some weird characters well we can go ahead and replace that with the actual title of the article now i want to tell you what's going on here is it's actually going to, what you're doing is giving the library all the information necessary so that they can go ahead and find the article for you yes this is literally someone from colorado state university libraries libraries going and searching for that article for you so they're doing all the work for you for completely free so next time you see your librarian thank them because they do a lot of work which is super great for us uh, once you kind of fill in all those fields like i said you might need to correct the title um, you go ahead and scroll down to the bottom and you submit your request and then that submits it to the librarian so that they can do some information searching for you I know that was a very quick way of going about how to do a literature search, but what I really would encourage you to do is um, A, run through the actual literature search that I did in the example for you by yourself to see if you can kind of copy the results. Now, I'll warn you, the results might be a little bit different because some time has passed since those um, keywords have been, been entered in and things are being constantly added into the library database. So there might be a few things different, but I think you'll get the idea and, and, and just go ahead and practice with, you know, using an interlibrary loan or, or, or finding a PDF article um, through the CSU library website. Um, I want to also give you some advanced tips and tricks for when you're searching in the search bar. Um, when you're searching in the search bar, you can always use these Boolean operators, they're called Boolean operators, which are and, or, or not to combine search terms to narrow or broaden your results. I think you could see those normally when you were typing in and then there's a little drop down menu afterwards where it says and or or not for you to click on. There's additionally something called the wild card, which is just putting a question mark within your search terms. The question mark replaces one character. So for example, if you've typed in NE question mark T, It'll find things that start with neat, nest, um, or even next, um, but it won't find things like net. Um, what it's doing is it's filling in random letter, any letter that would fill in a word that would work for that. 
Additionally, I mentioned this before, but you can use the truncation indicator, um, which is an asterisk. The asterisk replaces any number of characters and will find all forms of a root word. So for example, if you typed in therap star, it'll find things like therapy, therapies, therapists, therapists, therapeutic, therapeutically, and so on, and so on, and so on. What you do this for is you type in the actual root word when you really just want to find anything related to that root word, um, and it'll try to search for things. It really broadens up your search a lot, whereas the Boolean operators can either um, broaden or narrow your search. If you use the AND operator, that'll narrow your search. If you use the OR operator, it will broaden your search. If you use the NOT operator, it will narrow your search more as well. The wildcard question mark will uh, broaden your search as well. So keep in this in mind when you want to either broaden or narrow your search. So a real big lesson of this is to really just go ahead and just try it out. Um, go onto the CSU library website and search for things that are of interest to you, to you. You don't even have to necessarily start off with doing your um, topic assigned to you, so social identity theory or cognitive dissonance. You can go ahead and type in things like cyberbullying because if that interests you, then you can try and find articles associated with that and just search around the, and, and, and play around with it a little bit. Use some of the Boolean operators or the truncation techniques to see how the your searches differ based on how you use that. Um, so some things that I kind of want to say for when you actually start doing your search based on your um, topic, you should start by doing multiple searches. Mix things up a bit. Start off with the actual name of your theory, then read an article or two, and then from there you can find other words that are related to your theory or other topics of interest that you think would relate to it. Um, and then read it and then uh, mix up your search. Next, always look at the abstracts, not just the title. Sometimes the titles are a little bit misleading, but I would always encourage you to read the abstracts before you even read the entire article because if you might waste your time by reading the article and realizing halfway through, like this is nothing to do with what I want, where you could have just read the abstract, which is just a paragraph 250 word statement um, about the article. Um, of interest. It's just like reading like an even cl quicker cliff notes, right? I would rather just read the cliff notes of something before I read the whole book, um, just so I can get a good understanding of what the book is about, um, in this case at least. Um, additionally, some things I want to encourage you to do is try to find lots of useful articles for when you're doing your actual literature search. Find articles that are up to date, find articles that you understand, Find articles that look interesting to you. It's I honestly try to find articles that are interesting to me. Cyberbullying isn't a topic of interest to me, so I read things that are very interesting um, from them so that it makes my job a lot easier to do. Um, additionally, try to find articles that can be tied together and to your research question. You will be expected um, throughout this process to form a research question based off of your theory and then eventually form hypotheses as well. So keep that in mind is that that is a big goal of this uh, research papers you first you get a theory as we learned in lecture number one where theory kind of tops everything then you can form research questions and then from there you can form uh, hypotheses as well we won't get into the data or the results in this class but you definitely can talk about them um, about what you want to do so the research question and the hypotheses are going to be a big part of this paper uh, for you to go ahead and develop and additionally you know, once you find an article, you read the abstract and you determine this is an abstract of interest, read the actual article. I'll be honest with you, a lot of these articles, you're going to kind of read the introduction and you're going to say, okay, I understand the introduction. You're going to read the methods and the results and be like, I didn't understand any of that. And that's okay if you didn't understand it. The more exposure you have to these things, though, the better you get at understanding them eventually. Believe me, I went from not understanding um, anything, anything in methods and results sections. And now, to be honest, they're my favorite parts to read. Additionally, there's always a discussion section as well, which you may understand. So I would read through the entire title, entire article. So the introduction, the methods, the results, and the discussion 
with the understanding that you may not understand the methods and results sections very much, but the introduction and discussion will have all the information you need, is what I would really encourage you to do. Um, oftentimes, these are a few pages long. It's not crazy long. It's going to take you some time to read. You might have to reread some sentences. Um, I found myself having to reread sentences quite often, but it's very important that you read them overall. So really, that wraps up Unit 7, um, in which we learn how to do an actual literature search. So just to summarize, literature searches can provide a lot of information on a topic, um, and you should be searching for primary sources if you're going to write a scientific paper, especially for this class, which is what exactly what you're going to be doing. Um, and you can find all those primary resources from really, you really just need to use PsycInfo in the way that I taught you how to do it. If you just type in things from your uh, theory, then you can develop these um, research questions and hypotheses as well. Now we're on to Unit 8, where we're going to be discussing APA writing guidelines overall. Um, APA writing guidelines, I'll be honest, they're not the most fun thing to do, but they are extremely important, and, and I will be grading you very heavily based on your APA writing guidelines. Um, techniques and the ways that you do it, you will be docked points if you do not write an APA. So make sure you are writing an APA formatting. The APA book that you got is really great for this. Um, any information you need will be in that APA book. And additionally, hopefully I will cover most of it in this lecture as well. So our objectives for today is to learn the specifics of writing an APA style paper. And additionally, we're going to get an overview of introduction, methods, results, discussion, references, and the appendix of a research paper, which are all necessary components to a full research paper. Granted, for this class, remember, and I'm going to bring this up time and time again, because I don't want anyone to give me a results and discussion section on something that makes no sense. The only parts that you will be writing for the purposes of this class are an introduction, a methods section, and a references section. An appendix section, potentially, if your paper requires it, but chances are your paper will not require an appendix section. But we're going to get into more information as to what all of these are um, in the next set of slides. So let's go ahead and start up with the first aspect of an APA uh, paper, which is your title page. Um, so again, this unit's going to be a lot of just formatting and making sure that formatting is correct. Um, you know what? It, to be in honest, this is a slideshow that you should probably go back and reference time and time again when you're writing your paper so that you do things correctly because it's going to be unnecessary points you'll be losing if you do this incorrectly. So as can be seen from this slide, there are two types of title pages that be, can be conducted. The first one, which is to the left, is the professional title page, and the next one, which is to the right, is the student title page. I'll first go over kind of what this professional uh, title page has. Now I want you to note that the the type of title page we'll be doing is the student title page, but it's good and important information to have the professional title page. So some things that are apparent in the professional title page is something called a running head. A running head is a shortened version of your title that goes across every single page of the paper. Additionally, there's a page number, there's an actual paper title, the authors, or one author as well, all of their affiliations, and by affiliation I mean the schools or the uh, universities or the organizations that they are a part of, and additionally the uh, author's notes, which are oftentimes the um, more information about the author, kind of what they, um, where they lie in the department of the university, or sometimes even their emails of the or the um, any where any correspondences should be met as well. Additionally, to the right, you can see that there's a student title page. As you can see, this is a much simpler title page. Uh, you see that there's a page number but no running head, so you don't even have to worry about it. There's a paper title. There's an author. Um, chances are it'll be one author. If there were two authors, it would be um, you and your partner's name in the group. Um, there's an affiliation, so for you all, um, 
I know that some people are from different majors, so you can really put really whatever major uh, department you're part of. Uh, I think the majority of you will be Department of Psychology. Um, additionally, the course that this is for, so this will be for Psych 250, uh, Research Methods 1. Um, the instructor, which is me, which is Neil Yet. You don't put a doctor in front of that because I am not a doctor. And additionally, what the due date is. Uh, I'm not sure what the due date is at this current moment, but whatever the actual due date of the paper is. Here, just to emphasize so that it's available for your slides, you will be using the student title page for this class. If I see a running head, um, I will dock you points. So make sure you are using the student title page, which is indeed the simpler title page to perform. So I will really encourage you to make sure that you do this correctly um, and you don't want to lose unnecessary points. Like I said, that's what a lot of this lecture is going to be is if you listen to this lecture and actually um, make sure that you uh, participate in this lecture and go through the slides and refer back to it, you'll be sure not to lose unnecessary points, thus um, encouraging you to potentially get an A on this paper. So remember, this page goes on all by itself. There's no other um, part of the paper that starts here. It's simply putting it um, at the very front of the paper. Next, we'll be talking about the abstract. We learned about what an abstract was from the literature review section, where we talked about um, how you actually just read abstracts as a quick um, summary of what the paper is about. Um, and I will be having you actually write your own abstract. Um, as you can see um, from here, this is a about a 250 word um, summary of what your paper is about. As you can see from the upper right, there is indeed a page number associated with this, so you're on page two. Additionally, you write the words in bold, abstract, nothing is indented, and so that's something if you are indent your abstract, I will remove points, um, and you write a 250 word summary of the paper that you're turning into me. So keeping in mind that the summary that you'll be doing is just on the introduction and methods, you don't need to write about uh, results or discussion um, from your abstract here. So it might be a little bit shorter than normal, which is okay to me. It's all double spaced in the same font as the rest of the paper. Additionally, there's a keywords part to this as well. Notice how the keywords is indented. So this is another point where you can lose points pretty easily if you don't do this correctly. And then you italicize the word keywords and put a colon. Um, separate, you notice as well how all the keywords that I'm writing down, I want you to also take note that none of them are capitalized. This might be a little bit different than you're used to thinking. You say, oh my gosh, why would I not capitalize the words after a colon? Well, in the case of APA format, I can't really tell you why, but it's the way it is. Make sure all of your words are lowercase and separated by a comma. You don't need, here I think there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven keywords. I'll be okay with about two to three keywords, honestly. You don't need to do seven. If you do seven, that's okay, um, but I only need about two to three keywords um, that are associated with your um, paper. And one of your keywords can be the theory that you're working with. So if you are doing social learning theory, one of your keywords can be social learning theory. That is completely okay to have as a keyword. Next, we'll be talking about page three to however long your paper is really, which is the introduction, methods, results, and discussion. And these are what make up the entire body of your paper. So I like to think of the introduction as a background research of your topic. So this is a section that you actually will be writing for your paper that you'll be turning into me at the final of the class. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of different aspects to this that are really um, important. Um, I'm not going to be able to go through all of the aspects of this. Well, maybe I can. Um, we'll see how it goes. But um, but just I want you to make sure that we're all aware of what an introduction is and that an introduction is the background research to your topic of interest. So in this case, it's going to be the background in, um, information um, on your theory. And in a later class, I'm going to be actually discussing with you how to write a proper introduction paper. 
um, introduction to a paper, I should say. But here we're going to be talking about kind of the specifics and where you can lose some very, um, very unnecess unnecessary points. So uh, to start off, um, it will be, as you can see in the upper right hand corner, there will be a page title. Um, likely your, I'm sorry, not a page, on the upper right hand corner, there will be a page number. Um, likely your page number at this point will be three because you will have the title, the abstract, and then the introduction. Um, so for the paper title, you will bold that. You'll That will be the same title as was on your actual title page. It'll be bolded at the top. And then you will indent the first line and write this like a normal uh, paper. You will additionally be having citations throughout this, which are um, cover, which are covered in parentheses. You will be using those citations. This is from your literature search um, that you will be actually citing authors, and there's information on how to do that. Um, in your APA manual of the correct way to do it. So let's go ahead and read this first sentence in which it says, a majority of American experience, uh, I'm sorry, a majority of Americans experience stress in their daily lives. Then they cited that quote because that is a, um, a paraphrase that you would need to actually cite because it seems like we, although it might be obvious, we need some sort of citation to indicate that this is a true statement that someone else has said before us and that we're not just making this up on our own and you'll see throughout when you read the rest of this page that there's a lot of different um, uh, citations as well something else that i want you to note um, as well um, is the use of first person um, this is something that people oftentimes don't realize within an introduction in APA format is that you will actually be writing in first person format. So I do not want to see anything like the researchers or the or um, somebody's name performed. You will be writing as if you are writing the paper. This is all going to be in first person narrative. So make sure you keep that in mind. Um, additionally, I'll be talking about this in a later lecture, but you're going to be using um, an, at more of an action voice in which you are direct and clear. You do not beat around the bush at all. You say, I, you know, some sort of verb, um, provide a, um, you know, overviews. I provide overviews of both guided imagery and progressive muscle relaxation, as you can see near the bottom of the page, in which they are very strict and to the point. That's going to be a very great way for you to be an effective writer great, um, later on when you're actually writing your own research papers. Next, we have the methods pages. The methods page is uh, a little bit different. It's a part that directly uh, precedes your uh, introduction. And as you can see, um, you bold the word method um, after the introduction. And then to the left, you'll start talking about something like a sample or, or your instrument as well. Um, and you can read through kind of what this method looks like, but what this is doing is just laying out how your study will be conducted. Um, is really what it's talking about. You'll be talking about any instruments that you'll be using, and you can discuss what the um, internal reliability is of that um, instrument, or in, in, in some aspects of that instrument that you think are important. Um, Notice how in this method section, there are different levels. So we have sample, instrument, design, which are all bolded and to the left. And then directly after it, you have a indented paragraph to talk about which is the sample or the instruments or the design. This can go on for multiple pages, just like the introduction can go on for multiple pages as well. Next are the results pages, which is something that you won't be writing about, which you'll be actually writing in Psych 350. So keep in mind for Psych 250, what we have you do is we have you write the introduction and the methods to a paper. And in Psych 350, you'll be writing the results and discussion to a paper. So you won't have to worry about this as much for now, but I will say it's something that's very important for later. But essentially what a results page is, is, is what did your study find? What 
statistics did you calculate to determine um, what happened in your study? What did you do to answer your research question and your hypotheses? Is really all that a results page is. Um, and I want to also bring up that this is all available in your APA textbook as well. Next, we finally have the discussion page. This is where you are bringing everything together. In the discussion pages um, is where you talk about um, what our results found. It, because in a results section of a paper, you don't talk about um, what was actually found. You just bring up the statistics and say the statistics were this, this, and this, and that's it. And the discussion is where you talk about what those results actually mean. And you relate it to uh, previous studies, you relate it to your own research, you say whether or not your research questions were answered or if your hypotheses were supported, um, and so forth. Um, the discussion is probably one of the uh, well, they're all very important sections, I'll say, but the, the discussion is probably where really you get to say the most about your research project in general and why it's such an important project um, to talk about. So again, we will not be talking about how to write a results and a discussions page in this class. However, I will give you more information on how to write an introduction and a methods pages in later courses in this class. So keep that in mind. Lastly, we'll be talking about how to write your references and your appendices. The reference section of a research paper is where we list all of those parenthetical citations that we had before and how someone would be able to find them if they wanted to look for it on their own. Now, some things to notice this is that the reference section will be on its own separate page apart from the introduction method results and discussion. Um, it will always be on its own separate page. So even if your discussion ends at the very top of page 13, you will create a whole new page to talk about your references. It will not be on the same page um, as your discussion section, which is the last section. Or in this case, it will be in your paper, the method section will be the last section. Some things to notice, um, you have a journal article reference. There's a lot of information on how to reference a journal in the APA text um, that we can talk about um, later as well about how we will actually be um, referencing um, text from your paper and from your literature search. The reference page is in ABC order by first author's last name. So notice it goes Avery, Burke, Burke, Boyson, Boyson, and essentially over um, all the way down to whatever however many um, references you have. I will be expecting about a minimum of five references for your paper, um, but the more, the better. Um, you really can't have too many references. I will say I have had uh, pages among pages on scientific journal articles that I have written before. So it's really important to have as many references as possible. Um, you really can't have too many in all honesty. Um, but it can become um, overbearing when you're writing it. Lastly, we have the appendix page. This is where um, I don't think you're gonna have to worry about the appendix page. Um, I can't really see a reason. This usually corresponds with results, but this is where you list any tables or figures um, and that goes after the um, references page. Um, this is an APA formatting so that when you submit it to a journal that they can go ahead and plug it in wherever they feel is necessary within their um, uh, journal article. So as you can see from here, what you do is you list uh, table one in bold, and then you list the table or figure one in bold, and then list the figure as well. You'll be learning a lot more about how to do this in Psych 350, because this will become an essential point where you will actually be required to um, APA format a table and APA format a figure for Psych 350. Um, so we won't be discussing it too much in this class about the actual formatting techniques, but there is a lot of information in your APA textbook. So, as I stated before, I want to re-emphasize this. You will only be writing a title page 
an abstract, an introduction, a methods, and a reference section. There is potentially the possibility that some of you might want to have an appendix section, but I really don't anticipate it. But if I see you write a results and a discussion paper for me, um, it really doesn't make any sense. I'm sure you will struggle a lot, but make sure that it's kept in mind that that is all you will be writing is the title, abstract, introduction, methods, and references section. Now I will tell you um, in a later class, I will be teaching you um, about how to properly write an introduction and a methods um, part to a paper. Um, so keep that in mind. If you're kind of unclear as to what an introduction looks like, I'll give you some strategies on how to do that. So in summary, APA has specific stylings to follow that you need to follow and you will lose points on your paper if you do not follow these stylings. So keep in mind, you need to make sure you're going by the student's title page as opposed to the um, professional writing page. So if I see a running head in your paper, then you will be docked points and so forth. Additionally, there are many sections associated with writing an APA paper with those sections being uh, your title page, your abstract, your introduction, your methods, your results, your discussion, then your references section, and then your appendices. Now keep in mind, for the purposes of this class, you will not be writing every single one of those sections. And in fact, if you can, right now, I would really encourage you to recite what exact um, sections you'll be writing. And if you can't recite what sections you'll be writing, then I would recommend you go back to the previous slide so that we can, you will remember. All right, thank you.